morning. Thank you for that kind introduction. Kita tam skat noal kakio. I welcome you or greet you all in a good way today. Uh, I want to uh, recognize the original caretakers of this land. Uh, I was saying to a, a colleague this morning, I haven't spent a lot of time in the Winnipeg area, but I had some time to walk around yesterday after some meetings, and I really felt a sense of uh, place and uh, you know the richness of the people that have uh, uh, come before us. And so I want to uh, recognize the original caretakers of this land, and um, I feel really privileged uh, to, to be here. Um, the, uh, I won't go into my whole family uh, history here, but um, part of the Martel name uh, came through the Red River area at some point, and so uh, you know I have to believe that I've got ancestors that have uh, traversed this land as well, and so that's exciting for me. Um, and I'm here as a learner. I actually uh, my enthusiasm around evidence bubbled up when I was meeting with uh, Dr. Wilms a few weeks back, and uh, was invited just to introduce the day, but. Um, my goal this morning is, or today, is to be here as a learner. I'm not here to, uh, you know, teach you anything in particular or transfer any knowledge, which really takes the pressure off the next 20 minutes or so. <laughs> um, the Doug's influence has been uh, really instrumental in my professional work. I don't know about 12 years ago, Doug. I guess we worked on a panel, a large-scale assessment panel, for the province of Saskatchewan with some other uh, educators and. Um, I was kind of the junior in the group at that time and uh, learned so much about the role of evidence and evidence-based uh, work in, and purposeful work and, in uh, what we do in education. And My background is in community and indigenous education and so it was really uh, an, uh, an eye-opener for me you know, that Doug's prescriptions, I guess, or, or um, advice was not prescriptions, that um, uh, evidence had a place to, uh, a role to play in terms of reinforcing some um, uh, assumptions that we have and, uh, in, uh, you know, just improving what we do, improving our practice. So I guess, you know, through my 27 years in publicly funded education in Saskatchewan and a couple of years in band controlled schools before that, um, my greatest accomplishment is actually uh, that I'm a continuous learner and I've discovered continuous improvement and I actually think, I actually think I get better at it every year. I don't know if my principals would say that, but, um, What's on your desk? I was reflecting as I was putting some thoughts together that in 2002, when I started as a superintendent with Greater Saskatchewan Catholic Schools, um, you know, we had a lot of discrete files. Everything was kind of, you know, independent. They didn't speak to each other. First of all, we didn't have a lot of data on our desks, that's for sure. But, um, you know, when it came to staff supervision, for example, that was a discrete file that didn't really cross over the, um, you know, with the learning improvement agenda. And then I look at, you know, what we've got today, um, you know, we are all about leadership and, and integration, and I can't remember the last time in our schools that we've had the accusation that we're introducing something new that's just another fad. Um, everything is progressive, and it builds on, on what happened prior. Um, collaboration is key. We, we use collaboration for everything of substance in our planning and execution of a quality learning program, including a staff supervision evaluation. We have a collaborative uh, supervision model that um, puts those functions in the hands of teachers and teacher leaders. Um, we, we, just as you do, we work in an evidence-based environment and, uh, you know, uh, I'll talk a little bit about it later, but um, the way we use evidence is, is in a very intuitive way, I think, now when we, we use evidence to, you know, I think, reinforce uh, what we know professionally and to challenge us as well in terms of what we know uh, professionally. And everything is improvement oriented. That's what uh, that's what drives us. Um, my role within the division, just in case you have any false uh, illusions, I don't have the same scope of responsibility as uh, Dr. Brothers in um, Saskatchewan. Our titles are flipped, so our head uh, guy is the director, and then those under him are superintendents. So um, I have the great opportunity of working with um, a, a, a cadre of schools. So I work with eleven of 50 schools, about uh, 3,500 students in those schools um, of the uh, 18,000 students that are in our school division, Greater Saskatoon Catholic Schools. And um, I have other portfolios as well, division-wide, in terms of Indigenous education, community education, uh, leadership development, uh, improvement, and the like, but, and research. But um, mostly, uh, I work with 11 fantastic schools. 
And those schools, I guess, you know, the tendency is to first describe them demographically. And, um, you know, there's a high indigenous population in my schools, um, a low of about 25% to a high of 100%. I've got three of my schools that are 100% indigenous uh, students, uh, a school of approximately 400, another one, a high school of 300, and a, and a pre bilingual school of 650 of First Nations children. So, um, you know, the socioeconomic status is lower, the average annual, annual income, those kinds of things. But, you know, I'm always careful that that really doesn't define us. Our schools have been on the cutting edge of, of um, uh, learning improvement and collaboration for, um, well, I want to say 15 years because that's how long I've been there, but that would be pretty self aggrandizing uh, wouldn't it? So, for a long time. Um, we recognized uh, over a decade ago that um, you know we needed to do more than just put in place supports in terms of uh, nutrition and, and recreation and those kinds of things. But the best, uh, most sustainable outcome that we could achieve was to improve the efficacy of our professional teachers through building their knowledge and skills, and um, you know the, the result that, that would have on improved student learning outcomes. And so you know I'm proud within our division that our principal, the Southwest Sector principals have really led the division in terms of uh, learning redesign. Um, we have a lot of uh, variety of programs in our schools, uh, level literacy intervention, catalyst teachers, math warriors, where um, who'd have thought that First Nations students would come after school to learn math. We have waiting lists for those programs. Um, we do yoga and we eat good food and we do cultural activities and uh, teach the children uh, songs and how to introduce themselves in their language, indigenous languages and such and they do math homework and receive math supports based on their uh, their own uh, the, uh, basic, uh, their own assessments, I should say. Um, we have math coaching, which is an in-school um, math support uh, initiative. Um, differentiated allocations for staff in these schools and data-driven practice, that's what we're all about in the Southwest sector. So they are um, a terrific group of schools that um, you know, has a high, um, <coughs> sense of mission in the work that we do, but a high sense of uh, expertise and purpose in, in terms of how we respond. Um, in the evidence-based work we do in schools, uh, the early years evaluation has become one of the foundational pieces of evidence that we use right down to the classroom level, and I can't stress that enough. We are fortunate the province of Saskatchewan that the EYE is a provincial assessment. Um, it's one of many sources of um, evidence in terms of how our early learners are progressing and indeed how we're receiving them in terms of their readiness skills. But as I alluded to earlier, what we've come to know is where to place the evidence. So EYE doesn't loom over as the only piece of evidence. It's certainly, uh, we know where to merge that into professional conversations or professional practice. And so um, it's really become a foundational piece of what we do. Um, just as an example, uh, this, this are, these are our fall 2016 division results and certainly uh, cognitive skills and language and communication are two areas where um, you would identify that we've got uh, uh, some work to do. And then how we bring that into our uh, learning communities is through the context of our network principles and then into the context of their learning communities through um, the instructional rounds we do, observational inquiry and the sprints. And so um, these uh, graphs really um, become enlivened as we work with uh, the ever smaller uh, configurations of professionals on improvement. And so in the brief time that I have, I just want to illustrate a couple of schools of mine that I work with, one elementary and one high school, and just how they use the data um, in terms of uh, their own improvement uh, initiatives. Uh, one of my schools, the St. Francis Cree Bilingual School, is a, a just that, a Cree bilingual school, uh, 650 students uh, daycare to grade eight. And um, it's a partnership project with the Saskatoon Tribal Council. We developed the school uh, together, and we've got lots of um, uh, partnerships in the school as well, the Sask Sport and the College of Nursing. We've got nursing students in the uh, school every day. Um, the school draws from 57 neighborhoods. It's a, in Saskatoon, it's a citywide program. Students are bused there. Um, the uh, key feature of, uh, of uh, St. Francis is it's a professional development school. And a professional development school is a partnership between the college, the community, and the school to enhance the uh, professional practice of pre-service and in-service teachers. And that's probably as concise as I can pack the complexity of what a PD school is. But suffice it to say that there are um, secondary, post-secondary students on site every day learning with 
teachers. So um, there will be the Indian Teacher Education Program, uh, cohort, different cohorts on site, uh, learning before and after their student teaching and, and internship experiences. And it really raises the, um, the bar for all of our teachers as well. Uh, In-service teachers then are exposed to the same kind of cutting edge um, you know, theory and practice that uh, the students are in the college. And of course, their vast experience helps to uh, foster the development of some expert uh, uh, teachers that come through the, the Indian Teacher Education Program as well. Um, the, in the St. Francis uh, Cree Bilingual School, it's really an appreciative environment, and I really um, have to hand it to our expert teachers there. We've, because all our teachers are uh, Cree speaking, we've recruited from far and wide, uh, mostly. Uh, sorry, Ken and Laurie and others, but mostly come from they come from uh, First Nation schools where most of them have experience. So there's not a lot of new teachers that teach there. Most of them have extensive experience already in the field, and um, you know they're at the point in their careers where um, they're not just uh, learning the basics. They're really there to hone their professional practice, and that really makes a difference. Um, we really differentiate resources there, so I talked a little bit about math coaching and whatnot. We redesigned the learning assistance teacher role as well. Um, our goal at St. Francis is uh, mastery, staff mastery of core competencies, um, so that uh, the collaboration and, and learning community development really means a lot there. We've got some of our best teachers there that have probably the highest fidelity to guided reading and balanced literacy. These are the kinds of things that they do. Their assessment literacy is, is also very, very um, well developed uh, within the context of their learning communities. Um, one really interesting feature at St. Francis is that we've got a learning, um, uh, we've got a, a, a um, SLP project where teach, the SLP works in the context of the classroom with parents and grandparents and they really de-contextualize uh, what the SLP does and they work on oral language development in the context of the classroom. At St. Francis, we've, uh, in 2016, we have 43% of students reading at grade level, and you might say, well, that's low, but we have over 100% uh, mobility at that school. I think that puts it in perspective a little bit. That growth was also, um, we had 33% reading at grade level in 2015. Our value proposition there is one year's growth in one year's time. And at uh, St. Francis, 57% of uh, the students that were there all year grew one grade level or more. And so again, we restart every year. The needs are never going away, but uh, you know, our value proposition of growing one year in one year, one year's growth in one year's time is what we aim for. Um, this is just the after slide in terms of you know, the recognition of the growth in the division as a whole in terms of uh, cognitive skills and language. And of course, what we aim for, the excellent resources that come with from EYE, is we aim to see less red on the map. And um, you know that, uh, that is achieved through, um, it's not the evidence that changes that, it's the teaching in response to that evidence that changes that <coughs> profile. And just briefly, the other uh, foundational piece of evidence that we've really um, come to use well and use wisely within the division is the Our School Survey, formerly uh, Tell Them For Me. And this uh, grade four to eight, uh, again, provincially mandated, uh, thankfully, um, assessment uh, is an online assessment that uh, all grade four to eights um, complete every year. And it uh, really allows us to um, recognize some uh, very subtle influences and some complex associations that when, then we take into planning. Um, in, in our schools uh, to improve programming. Just a couple of slides. Uh, advocacy at school, Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal results, these kind of indicators mean a lot to us, that students feel that they've got an ad advocate in the school, um, that students feel the school is a safe place to be. Uh, again, disaggregated is an important indicator for us. Um, that students are interested and motivated. Uh, these are the kinds of things that we used to take for granted that they either were or they weren't. But now we know that it's what we do in terms of uh, responding to these student needs that will cause um, these uh, indicators to change over time. Uh, valuing student outcome, or school outcomes again, uh, disaggregated, an important indicator for us. Um, just very briefly, another one of my high schools uh, is a Urban First Nations uh, High School, Wilskayak High School. It was part of the original um, 
Native Survival School framework that uh, was uh, across the country in a variety of cities, including uh, Winnipeg at one time, I think it's probably Children of the Earth or, or whatever uh, now. Uh, it's gone through a variety of um, eras in its history, from reclaiming to focusing more on student supports to now again um, a cutting edge learning program. And the, the turnaround that happened at Oskayak is really um, built on the then tell them from me survey. That is what um, drove our interventions there and caused the turnaround where now this, the program is highly influenced by um, uh, a very well developed uh, cultural program, uh, problem based learning throughout all classrooms, a high use of technology. We are at one to one um, devices in the school for all students, uh, credit recovery, lots of partnerships, and, and of course, we maintain the supports for learning with daycare, transportation, those kinds of things. We have a U Pass uh, agreement with the city where students get a free bus pass or not free, we pay for it, but uh, uh, there's uh, transportation uh, supports for students. Um, some of the changes that this intervention uh, resulted in is a 71% uh, increase in enrollment, 58% increase in students that registered in maths and sciences, which we think is an excellent indicator. Um, when I tell you about the credit delivery uh, results, you might think that you know our prior state was scandalous, and in a lot of ways it was, but I think it speaks to the complacency that trickles in when you have high um, need students. Uh, for many years, we had around a 30% credit delivery rate, and of course that's untenable. And when we did our turnaround there, based on the evidence from Tell Them For Me, we managed to uh, uh, bring that uh, credit delivery rate up to the 80%. It's up about 84, 85 right now, and it, it has been maintained there for a number of years. Um, graduates in the past with a similar uh, enrollment were in the single digits, and now there's over 60 graduates a year out of that school. In a lot of ways, it becomes a finishing school. A lot of students attend for uh, grade 12. Uh, it won a, a Premier's Award for Innovation and Excellence in, in uh, Education. Um, and I guess just in summary, I'd say that, uh, you know, with my wonderfully talented group of principals, um, we talk about uh, what we've termed emancipatory education, like what do we do as education leaders that helps to change the trajectory of some of the oppressive conditions that many of our students uh, experience in their lives and in their school experience. And so we talk about two things. We talk about reculturing schools. That is the purpose of education, that there's a quality, evidence-based education that is akin to the lives and worldviews and cultures and histories of the students that we serve, mostly indigenous students. We also talk about reforming schools for effectiveness, and that's, we can control both of those in a lot of ways. We can, I should say, contribute to both of those in a lot of ways. Um, our, our, um, what drives us is, is building teacher professionalism, uh, system leadership in terms of the Hopkins kind of uh, network schools uh, era or uh, configuration and reliable data. And we need the data to be able to tell the stories. It's just another um, narrative of many that are woven into the work that we do. And so we, we have purpose in our schools, uh, improve student learning outcomes. We develop professional practice in terms of developing consistent pattern approaches. If you're in the healthcare system and you have a, whatever, a heart attack or something, you would expect that there would be patterned uh, some particular interventions that would be given to you by way of course. And we are achieving that in our schools where if you're, depending on your learning profile, you would expect that there would be interventions provided to you by way of course. So we're trying to reduce the variability uh, between schools and among, uh, between classrooms as well. So that there's standards of professional practice that help our students to achieve uh, consistently higher outcomes so that we can, they can open doors for themselves and uh, have a, a life that they aspire to. So that's the whirlwind tour of the Southwest Sector Schools. Uh, we've got a lot of good things uh, happening, and like I said, I'm here today as a learner, not uh, as a teacher, and I'm looking forward to more narratives being shared, and uh, really looking forward to the work of Dr. Wilms, uh, how that will be shared out today. And uh, so I wish you all the best, have a great day, and thank you for welcoming me to Winnipeg.